Good evening and welcome to ILTV Weekly. Joining me this evening is human rights and merits activist Uri Zaki, who is co-host of the ILTV program, Israeli Frenemies. Back for a third week in a row is Dan Diker from the Jerusalem Center for Public Affairs. We have several issues on tap today, so we'll move along quickly. A phone call between President Trump and Abu Mazen, a controversial new U.S. ambassador to Israel, is close to confirmation. The Knesset moves to ban BDS activists from entering the Jewish state. Polls show a lead for Yeshatid if elections were held today. And we open with the important visit to Moscow by Prime Minister Netanyahu. Talks between Netanyahu and Russian President Vladimir Putin focused on what the Israeli leader called Iran's attempts to establish a permanent military foothold in Syria. Let's hear from both leaders. Dan, do you think that President Putin, Russian President Putin, agrees with Netanyahu that there must not be a permanent Iranian presence in Syria? Well, I think that uh, each leader has his own national interests, and clearly uh, Putin ha has been a strong supporter of the Assad regime, primarily because he suffers from a very serious Salafist presence in Moscow and in Russia altogether. So his view is that if, he, if, if, uh, uh, if his side, if the Salafists win, if the so-called opposition radical opposition wins, he's going to be in big trouble at home. So that's his, so that's his, uh, uh, that's his national interest. Bibi, Net Prime Minister Netanyahu's uh, chief interest is that Israel still has freedom of the skies and the ability to enforce Israel's red line security requirements north of the Israeli border. That is absolutely essential. And this is the first time probably since, uh, certainly since 1967, where Israel actually has a competitor. Uh, in potential, which is the Russian Federation and its ability to, t to control the airspace north of Israel. That's potentially extremely dangerous strategically for Israel. And clearly, Mr. Netanyahu wants to coordinate with Mr. Putin, who has a natural affinity for Israel, frankly, but to make sure that this security coordination uh, is maintained and no terrible mistakes uh, are made that could uh, end up in a, in a serious a strategic uh, a, a potential conflict with the Russians. Ori, once upon a time, the main fear from Israel, I think, would be of a permanent Russian presence right. in, in Syria, north of our border. Now it seems like Russia's okay. We can coordinate with them. We're not worried about their bases and their Air Force presence in Syria. A bit odd, no? Look, uh, I think uh, that's exactly what Putin is trying to do here, in a sense. Going back to uh, Russian dominance in the Middle East, uh, I, don't th I think it's absurd to think that he'll give up his cooperation with Iran. It's a cornerstone uh, in his Middle East policy, this uh, axis between him, Iran, and the um, Syrian Assad regime. Um, and uh, I'm not sure we don't have anything to be concerned about. Uh, with a R Russian presence here. First of all, uh, if Netanyahu uh, defines Iran as the main threat on the state of Israel and Russia is so much aligned with Iran, having Russia as the big boss in uh, Syria and, and uh, in Lebanon through Hezbollah is something that Israel has to be concerned about. I think it's good that we're in a time, unlike uh, the 60s and 70s, when we didn't have any dialogue uh, with the Russians, uh, I do think it's important uh, to have this uh, line of uh, talks between us and, and the Russians. Well, Dan, the, the Israeli security experts are all saying that the real main threat to Israeli security on any border is Hezbollah, with all the rockets pointed at us. Does coordination with Russia do anything in terms of uh, pushing back against the Hezbollah threat? 
Well, it seems that it would because Russia has a major presence on the ground uh, in Syria and they know exactly what's uh, going on in Lebanon as well. And they, they are a stopgap measure uh, for Israel. And you're right. The is all this because the U.S. is not there and Russia's kind of moved into this vacuum? Clearly, the Russia has, has filled a security vacuum that the former Obama administration had created by uh, basically collapsing. And all of the United States' traditional Arab Sunni allies are quite aware and have been, you know, extraordinarily frustrated would be an understatement uh, uh, to uh, uh, having sat with a number of these uh, uh, leaders uh, who spoke openly uh, of their uh, uh, of difficulty with American retreat uh, in the uh, in the Middle East, but uh, uh, but clearly the Russians are the major are the superpower uh, in town, and uh, Israel wants to do everything they can to, to coordinate with them to make sure we can maintain our vital security interests, which should we should be able to do. Uh, uh, with the uh, with the Russians and also in curbing Hezbollah. Remember, they have up to 150,000 rockets that could hit anywhere in Israel by the thousands per day, and that is the first major strategic home front home front threat, major threat that we've we face. Much bigger strategic threat. Uh, our secure Israel security experts are saying than the nuclear threat from Iran itself. The Knesset has passed a law that prohibits the Israeli Interior Ministry from issuing entry visas and residency permits to foreigners who support the BDS boycott of Israel, while allowing permits in specific cases. First, we'll hear the I an ILTV report on the ban, and then we'll hear from activist Udi Aloni, the son of former cabinet minister and longtime Meretz leader Shulamit Aloni. The Knesset is expected to pass into law a bill that would ban supporters of anti-Israel boycott movements from entering the country. The proposed legislation would permit Israeli authorities to deny entry visas or residency rights to any foreign national calling for economic, cultural, or academic boycotts of either Israel or the West Bank settlements. The Interior Minister Arya Deri, though, would be able to make exemptions on a case-by-case -case basis. The bill passed its first reading in November by a landslide margin of 42 to 15 with seven abstentions. Critics have called the bill political persecution and said it seeks to silence a legitimate political protest. Knesset member Roy Folkman of Kulanu, one of the bill's sponsors, rejected the idea, saying the law doesn't cover any individual who ever said something, but that it is aimed mainly at organizations that work against the country. Could you comment on the fact that many have drawn comparisons between Trump's most recent, uh, and although it's the second version of it, uh, executive order uh, which uh, bans refugees and, and Muslims and people from six uh, Muslim-majority countries from coming into the U.S., uh, the comparison uh, between that ban and what Israel has just uh, instituted? I want to say it's maybe worse, because the real law that Israel passed just a few weeks ago said that legally Jews allowed to steal lands from Palestinians only because they are Jews and those are Palestinian. I want to repeat it, because people here in America don't believe it. We have a new law that settlers allowed to steal private lands of Arabs and take it to Jews. This is an official law. And now they're going to ban everyone who criticizes a pure apartheid law. So in a way, it's, it's horrific. It's only everyone who stand for civil right in the minimum level, liberals, not radical, is not allowed to Israel. I think that Trump and Bibi are in competition who is getting worse or who is getting more weird about anti-democratic laws. And they're very similar, and they enjoy each other too much. Well, American, a black American, anywhere in the, in the north or south. All right, our guests have been arguing uh, <laughs> while we were listening to that sound, by quite differences of opinion. Uh, uh, Uri, do you agree with uh, Uri Aloni that the BDS ban is worse than the U.S. Uh, entry ban against Muslims? I don't want to compare. Both of them are very bad. Uh, look, I'm a longtime opposer of uh, BDS. The BDS movement hailed my uh, departure of B'Tselem USA, said, uh, is the uh, uh, Zionist propaganda for B'Tselem ended when I left? So, you know, I have my anti-BDS credentials, but having said... B'Tselem Zionist propaganda. That's exactly what they wrote in uh, Electronic Intifada when I left. Um, and by the way, I don't, I don't see a contradiction on the contrary. Uh, but having said all that, I do believe that uh, Mr. Loney uh, is right. I think this bill is stupid. I think it's, uh, uh, it's a bill that, that suits regimes like in North uh, Korea or in Iran, where if you're not letting people criticize you, 
into the country, would that weaken their cause or would that make their cause stronger? I strongly believe it makes their, their uh, cause stronger because they say, you see, they're so much afraid of what we have to say, they're afraid of the truth, and they're not even let us in. Every person that would be banned from entering Israel would have a mic and an interview and a primetime show to, to present their case. So I think it's silly. Dan, I think it's fair to say that you're one of Israel's leading experts on BDS. You've written uh, a, a booklet about it, um, and, and you've been following developments. There are Jewish activists in BDS. Some of those guys will come here, and they, th they, they pose no direct security threat to Israel. Would you be in favor of this law to ban them from the country? The problem here, Steve, is that people misunderstand what the BDS leadership is all about. People look at BDS boycott, divestment, and sanctions and look at it as a legitimate, peaceful, grassroots uh, way of criticizing Israel. This does not have to do with criticizing Israel. This has to do with subverting Israel as a nation state. This would be, the, the BDS law is a national security law, which would be tantamount to the United States banning any foreign person who wants to come into the United States, use, it, use a, a, a three-month uh, B-2 visitors, v, uh, uh, visitors visa in order to call for the overthrow of the United States. That's, that's e exactly tantamount to what's happening. What we did in, in BDS Unmasked is to unmask these connections between BDS leadership in Israel, such as Omar Barghouti and other, and a lot of the NGOs in Ramallah and actual terror groups, uh, Hamas, um, other Hamas fronts in the United States, like the Muslim Students Association, like the AMP, the American Muslims for Palestine, which actually was a, was a subject of testimony in front of Congress. We have, there is overwhelming evidence that the BDS campaign is a campaign to subvert and ultimately isolate and cause the unraveling and destruction of the state of Israel. So you're in favor of banning BDS activists? The, the, in, in so far as those activists can be, are, are there is evidence that they uh, are working uh, towards the subversion of, uh, of Israel, yes. Okay, first of all... Subversion. That's subversion, a that's a strong word, but the, the law doesn't talk about that. The law talks even about calling for, let's say, I, I don't buy products from the settlements. So according to that law, if I would have been an, uh, an American Jew and not an Israeli Jew, I could not have uh, and, and called publicly for banning uh, settlements go settlement goods, which, you know, the settlements is the core issue in the political debate both within Israel and outside Israel, calling for that, that's enough. According to the law that was passed, not according to your research, according to the p law that was passed uh, last week in the Knesset, I will be banned from entering Israel. That's crazy. Freedom of speech is, is extremely important in liberal democracy. It's ex extremely important in American democracy, and it used to be extremely important here in the state of Israel. And such a law, and you start, and, and by the way, that law, although was passed against uh, non-Israelis, it definitely, uh, its, it's uh, real cause is to put a, uh, 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 a cross on those Israelis who oppose settlements, who call for the end of the Israeli occupation in the West Bank, which again, this is the main argument in Israel. And to ban people because of their points of view, that's crazy. If they have connection to terror, by the way, the current legislation is enough. You don't need a new legislation for that. If someone is connected to terror, it would, uh, that person would be banned both in Israel and the United States. We're not talking about that. We're talking about uh, freedom of, of, of expression, freedom of uh, uh, thoughts, and I think that's completely crazy. And it's part of the deterioration of you know, Israeli you, democracy. You, you know, you know, it's extraordinary, Steve, is that what the left, what the left has done, there, there's been such an abject political failure by the left when it comes to Oslo, when it comes to reading where the Israeli consensus is. Today, the Israeli consensus, as you can see by the voting patterns, has moved due to the complete collapse of the concept of, uh, of turning over power, turning over weaponry. But what weaponry does that have to do with this legislation? PLO. has everything to do with it. Because so what you the ban left, people because of their No, what uh, the left has opinions? done is to, is to engage in self-demonization in order that they win popularity with um, communities and with states abroad. And, the, and there is a, a direct connection between the fact that Israel, sin, in the last 23 years, has made so many territorial concessions and other concessions for the cause of peace. And today, Israel's reputation in the international community in the West is worse than it was at any time between 1967 and 1993. So here you have legislation that is uh, that has been designed to stop this wholesale 
call for subvert. It's really subversion of the state of Israel. It's exactly what you read the other law? countries. It's not about subversion. It's about you don't calling need, you for, don't need to for read economical the law. You don't, for instance. You don't need to read the law to understand the difference between self-demonization and basic Excuse consensus sir, patriotism. That's, but that's not what the law says. And if we're so uh, uh, marginalized, as you, if you, as, as you say it, and, and all that, why do you need to make it illegal? That's where a country loses its, uh, its stand, it, both in the world and here. Well, well, if we're so well, marginalized, if we're so unimportant, how come you need a legislation to ban people with opinions from entering? I think that's All right, General, you know, we're going to have to stop here with this argument because we've got to move on to the next subject. Trump lawyer David Friedman has now all but secured confirmation as the next U.S. ambassador to Israel. It's a controversial posting because Friedman is a strong supporter of the settlement movement and he has gone as far as to call the left-wing Jewish movement J Street worse than Kapos. Mm -hmm. Friedman apologized for that language, but critics are not impressed. This from the confirmation hearing. Some of the language that I used during the highly charged presidential campaign that ended last November has come in for criticism and rightfully so. While I maintain proud, profound differences of opinion with some of my critics, I regret the use of such language. I want to assure you that I understand the critical difference between the partisan rhetoric of a political contest and a diplomatic mission. Partisan rhetoric is not appropriate in achieving diplomatic progress, especially in a sensitive and strife-torn region like the Middle East. I will also faithfully observe yeah. the David Friedman, you promote racism, fund illegal settlements. We will not be silenced. You do not represent us, and you will never represent us. Confirmed by the Senate, I also intend to faithfully observe the directions given me by the President and the Secretary of State without regard to my personal opinions. Well, Dan, the President that he's referring to, Donald Trump, just called Abu Mazen. Friedman is a very strong supporter of the settlement movement. He is an opponent of the two-state solution. Can he really represent a policy that thinks that Abu Mazen, uh, Mahmoud Abbas, uh, should be brought back into the discussions for negotiations? Clearly, he represents, <clears throat> Steve, one of the major mistakes that is taking place in Israel is that we are having a, a discussion about the appropriateness of David Friedman when this has nothing to do with the Israeli political discussion. It has, this is a decision by the President of the United States to be confirmed by the Senate of the United States, and, and, and Israel works with any uh, appointed and approved representative, man or woman of every race, creed, color, uh, American that has been confirmed by the Senate. So that's, from, from our point of view in Israel, it's irrelevant. Um, no one asked, you know, when, when uh, Dan, Dan Shapiro, who was our, the outgoing um, uh, American uh, representative, the American ambassador, who, who did a, by many, uh, uh, by many assessments, a stellar job for an administration that that Israel, the consensus in Israel, had very serious problems with, beginning with the prime minister. So there, it, it's an irrelevant question for Israel. The fact that he doesn't, he may or may not support a uh, the the establishment of a Palestinian state is only relevant insofar as what his boss, the president of the United States, wants. President Trump has said it's up to Israel and the Palestinians to come up with a solution. The United States is not going to interfere. Even they will, of course, sanction uh, processes. But this is a, they want to return this peace process to its owners, which is the Israelis and the Palestinians. Ori, were you heartened by the call from Trump to Abu Mazen. The Palestinians certainly seemed pleased with it. Do you think that we could actually get the talks back on, on, on track, or at least get discussions underway? Um, heartened is a big word. Uh, I don't know. I mean, uh, President Trump so far uh, is, how would I say it? It's hard to understand exactly where he stands. And I think um, those who might be panicked, by the way, uh, are those who thought the Messiah has arrived, uh, those who live in the settlements, those who lead the settlement movement, who thought uh, this uh, um, redhead uh, Messiah has arrived and uh, we can build and, and annex and do whatever we want. 
Uh, it's interesting, by the way, because I've been following President Trump's um, talking about uh, the Israeli-Palestinian deal from before he was elected. It's, quite, it's one of the only things he's consistent about. Uh, he has something in his mind. I don't know exactly. I don't know whether it's uh, uh, feasible uh, to, to put together. He, he believes that his uh, skills as a businessman uh, to take these two sides and, and to have a compromise. To make a deal. Exactly. It, it is true, though, that if President Trump does it, he'll have a much easier time than President Obama because he's so much, uh, and, and the way he was uh, perceived by the Israeli right, the, the fact that the uh, settler uh, leadership was in his inauguration uh, in Washington, uh, it will be very hard for Netanyahu to say, look, I, uh, you know, uh, I don't accept. W what Netanyahu did to Obama, he can never do to Trump. He put all his cards on the Trump administration. And therefore, if Trump really goes for that, uh, that would be interesting. Um, by the way, regarding uh, uh, Ambassador Friedman, I do hope, I, I, I agree that uh, it's an internal American uh, issue, and as we saw, also an internal uh, American Jewish issue. Uh, I would expect uh, Ambassador Friedman uh, because he was so much involved in the most uh, toxic Israeli uh, um, political debate, which is on the settlements and on the occupation, to uh, act diplomatically once he's here and to reach out to all segments of the Israeli society and the political spectrum. If he does that, I think that's uh, quite okay. All right, we're just about out of time, but before we are, I want to get to one last issue, and that is, according to the latest Channel 2 poll on the political climate in Israel, it shows that if elections were held today, the largest party would be Yesh Atid. We're looking now at the numbers. The numbers are up on the screen. I'm not going to read it all out to you, but Dan, does this appear as though Israel has moved, in effect, to the center, where Yesh Atid, in theory, could put together a coalition or a, a unity government with Likud, with labor, led by the center. I, I, is that possibly where Israeli politics are heading towards? Well, the, it's a very fluid political situation in Israel, and you can see it in these numbers. You've got this huge distribution. And in fact, Israel today, Steve, I think I'm wondering, we would agree is one big, is really a big center with some outliers, uh, uh, you know, Baita Yudi on the one hand, and perhaps you can argue on, on foreign policy issues, merits on the, other, on the other side. But it is one big center that we're dealing with in Israel, and a number of different coalitions are possible. This, what is happening today, is uh, really, I think, a decision by many in the political echelon that they want to switch out for whatever reason, the prime minister. And they, it's, a, it's, a, it's a personality issue. It's, an, it's a personal issue more than it is a party issue. Um, it, it, just uh, to end, the positions of Yair Lapid with regard to the peace process are, are not very different at all than Mr. Netanyahu. Mr. Netanyahu is the most left-wing member of his own party. And, 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 uh, he would not like that. That's yeah, true. <laughs> that it, it, it's, it's true. He is, he is well, really the most add, liberal side of his own party. We're just about out of time, but we want to ask Gory, this poll is not very good for the left. Uh, merits with six, uh, labor with, I think. It's, uh, it's one more than we have. Uh, like in 17 the, seats in total for, for, for right. the left of center parties. Is the only way to replace Netanyahu with via uh, Lapid? I don't think so. I think, uh, by the way, the reason uh, Yair Lapid is getting uh, support is both because Labor Party has kind of uh, neglected uh, its uh, role as an alternative, and on the other hand, Netanyahu, whom I agree he could have went, uh, could have gone to the left, but he's uh, uh, positioning himself in the far right, uh, following every lead that uh, Bennett uh, is is uh, leading, and I think that's his mistake. He could have been much more popular within the center, and I think Israelis, uh, there's also uh, Netanyahu fatigue, and, and uh, they want to see On the other hand, else. it's going to be very difficult for Yeshati to, to coalesce with the ultra-Orthodox parties. That is, that is well, he could that, form a coalition without them. That, it, it's going to be very block. difficult. It's gonna be, I, I, would, I would still think mm -hmm. that Netanyahu has a strong chance, if he is the candidate, to, uh, to form the next coalition. Well, it, it was a great dynamic with the two of you. I'm really glad. I hope I'll have you both back again together. Yeah. Uh, but that's all the time we have for this edition of ILTV uh, Weekly. Thanks for joining us, and also thanks to our guests, Dan Dyker and Orizaki. I'm Steve Leibowitz, and this has been ILTV Weekly.